their shirt is spiked for the evening. This is one of my favorite cartoons, and I'm just going to warn you right ahead. I have 68 slides and 45 minutes. This one, this cartoon is one of my favorites. It's one of my wife's favorites. We have about 4,000 books in our basement on history and other things. And I have a pedantic streak about as deep as the Grand Canyon. So what we have here is Sherman, the assistant to the buffalo hunter. Quick, Sherman, hand me my buffalo rifle. Those are American bison, sir. The term buffalo refers to a variety of species of bovine which can be found only throughout Asia, Africa, and Europe. The correct response. <laughs> Followed by, hand me my pedantic jackass rifle, right there, Wilson. <laughs> yes, sir. So with 68 slides, I have quite a bit of material. I'm going to try not to throw you into seizures by skipping over stuff. But we are going to talk about a lot of material that, frankly, kind of resonates with our own times. We're going to be talking about high levels of integration. We're going to be talking about economic uncertainty and inequality. We're going to be talking about terrorism. And we're going to be talking about how a society embracing all these things reacts to it for good or for ill. in Poland. And as many, many of you may know, in the 1860s, Poland as a country did not exist. That was because over a century, or, uh, or uh, toward the end of the 17th, 18th century, it was divided in three partitions by Germany, then the Kingdom of Prussia, Russia, and the Empire of Austria. So what that meant, by 1795, the nation of Poland as an independent entity ceased to exist. However, the Poles did not. What that happened was they became citizens of three separate countries. This is Posen, now Poznan in Poland. This is the reconstruction of the Middle, Aged, uh, Middle Ages downtown. The original was destroyed in 1945 in the battle between the Germans and the Soviet, Soviet Red Army. They did a pretty good job of reconstructing it, however. And it's kind of remarkable that the Soviets would bother to do that, but it was one of their uh, quote unquote wedding gifts as they forcibly took over Poland. Uh, but this was the land. The Posen in Prussia was where Leon Chalgosh's father was born, Paul. Paul was a laborer. He would be a laborer his entire life. He would come over to the United States. He would never learn the language. And he would die in Cleveland in the care of his daughter, Cyrilla. So, in the late 1800s, what you see is Polish people from all three parts of divided Poland coming to the United States, and in huge numbers. It started in the 1870s. Why? Well, here's the result. By 1900, 5.8% of the state of Michigan was of Polish origin. And uh, the numbers here were between 100 and 150,000. In the east, in places like Pennsylvania and York, what you had was uh, upwards of 300 to 350,000 Poles. And this was an age of truly unrestricted immigration. Why? The first one was economic, Szaklewa. And I apologize to those of you who know Polish better than I do. My pronunciation is going to be a little bit off. But what that means is for bread. You would come over, the father would come over to the United States, usually the father or an older brother, singly come over here, earn money, and eventually bring his family over. It was a search for economic opportunity. What was happening was there was the great estates were being taken over. Uh, small Polish farmers were losing the battle with the great German, Austrian, and Soviet, or Soviet, a little early for that, Russian uh, landowners. And so, well, we can't burn our bread, we'll come over here. The second reason is something called the Kulturkopf, and this happened in German-controlled Poland. In 1870, roughly, Otto von Bismarck, the chancellor of what was then the German Empire, decided that he was going to really Germanize things and decided to take on, starting with the Catholic Church. The Jesuits were a suppressed Catholic, uh, Catholic education was coming under assault. Essentially, he tried to turn Christianity, starting with the church, into a department of the German state. This was resisted fiercely by the man on the right, uh, Pius IX, Eventually, 
because of German reaction and German Protestant reaction too, we saw that they were going to be next. Uh, they backed off, but it was really intense in the Catholic areas uh, of the Polish areas administered by the German Empire. And related to this was basically at the same time he's taking on the Catholic Church, Bismarck is determined to make all of Germany as German as possible. Not just uniting the fragments of the German Empire into one cohesive whole, but making sure that Polish children and German occupied Poland weren't, Pol weren't German. You know, the language was suppressed, it was looked down upon, you couldn't speak in public, you were punished in school. So the Germanization was a huge problem from a Polish national perspective. And the same thing happened in the Russian part, Russianization. And in some ways, in Russia, it might have been worse because the Russians kind of looked at themselves as the great Slavic brother, Wayne and Feller, in our example. So you have a stream of people coming out of German and Russian Poland because of this. And this is where you really see the shift. As of, 18, as of 1880, you can see that most of the people coming from the United States were from Germany, Scandinavia, Britain, and Ireland. By 1900, those had pretty much dried up or considerably dried up. And now you've got it from Russia, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And you're talking about the millions, two million each over that decade. This is Paul Chagosh in 1902. Uh, again, he never learned English. If you can see right here, there's a lapel pin. That's actually a picture of Leon. Not that he was proud of Leon, what Leon had done, he was horrified. But it was a custom of Poles, if you could get a picture of your deceased loved one, you would wear it. And Paul and his entire family were nothing other than horrified by what Leon had done. But he was still their son. And you can see this is a man who really, he labored his entire way through life. This is worn down. He was never a man afraid of work. So what happened? Well. Paul was born in 1843 in Gora, Russia, now Gora, Poland. He married a woman named Mary Novak and arrived here in Michigan in 1872 in Detroit. He brought the entire family, which is suggestive of the fact that he was probably fleeing from the culture camp. As I said before, if you're coming for economic reasons, you sent one person over to test the waters. He brought the whole family over. And, uh, you know, quickly upon his heels. Leon was born here in Michigan in, on May 5, 1873. I've kind of waffled on this, but I, I agree that he was baptized at St. Albertus in Detroit. The only reason I've ever waffled on it is because the baptismal certificate says Paul Chalgowski and Mary Chalgowski. I was thinking, a Polish parish can't get Chalgosh right. Who is? But... Contrary to what my wife always says, spelling always counts. It doesn't count in history. It never has. And if you ever want to tell your kids that spelling counts, never have them read George Washington in the primary sources. The man spells nothing consistently ever. <laughs> Great man, brilliant man, but spelling and Lincoln too. Spelling optional is the motivation. It just seemed to be, uh, I'll, get it on, I'll get it in the paper and worry about it later. They moved to Pole Town. And in Pole Town in Detroit, then, and until it was destroyed by GM, um, it was really a nice area. It was not like the, the tenements out east you know, were crammed into Manhattan or the Lower East Side. These areas were fairly spacious compared to what you could expect from uh, Philadelphia or New York or Boston. And it was really a place where the community gelled very quickly. And Leon moved into a house. That is Leon, by the way. So you can see how quickly he wore out compared to before. That's a lifetime of labor, before and, before and after. He worked on the dockyards and then sewers and factories. Um, they lived in Benton Street. You can't find it now. Um, his wife Mary took him to Washington for money, and Paul was really well liked by the Polish community. He was a great storyteller, and unfortunately, if you were on the opposite side of the table from him, a much better card player. This is Detroit in the 1870s. There's exactly one bit, one monument in there that's still uh, right here. That's Campus Martius. That's the Civil War Memorial. That's the only thing that's still there. Everything 
else has been torn down or replaced. But this is what you would have seen, what Paul would have seen walking to work every day. And again, in the 1880s and 1890s, this is the second one. is looking down woodwards toward the river. Again, almost nothing there is still there. You know, the spirit of Detroit would be over here, for those of you familiar, heading towards the river in the city county building. The Polish community grew quickly. This is St. Albertus Church. This, this is the current church. This is the best picture I found of the previous one, white clapboard. And the Polish community was not afraid to decorate, move, and to build. That's what St. Albertus looks like now. It is only open once a month because it was taken over by the society, uh, by the because it was closed, the dwindling neighborhood. But it's still available. We still hold mass there once a month. And really, quite quickly, it would have looked like this. Albertus, St. Albertus looked like this by about the 1890s. So they poured their hearts, hearts and treasure into their churches. Now we're going to move to rural Michigan because about 1876, Paul decides to head north. He wants to get some land. He's a Polish farmer. Land is where you get your wealth. This, because I'm from Elma, I have to write about this one. This is a picture of Elma, Michigan in 1900. What's going on here is not a traffic jam, because Alma and traffic jams are entirely separate ideas. Uh, this is McCormick Day. The McCormick Reaper Company would hold a festival and bring in all the farmers in the Nickin community and hold literally like a barbecue, potluck. They would bring beverages. They would celebrate it. You'd bring your Reaper and show it off. <laughs> and McCormick was happy to do it because that sold more Reapers. And we're going to hear more about McCormick later, but this is the kind of, this was rural life. And unfortunately with the horses, one of the first things you'd smell in rural life, and actually in city life, the smell of horse flop was really, you could be guaranteed to smell it, would be the first thing that to hit the noses until about 1915. So it would, after a while, it'd be something if you'd never been to the city, you'd notice it, or you were from it. Somewhere in Europe where horses were not common, but that's the way life went. Roughly 1876, um, the records are a little sketchy because the house in Alpina that the Chagashes lived down had a lived in had a fire, and they lost most of the family records. But we roughly in late 1876 they moved up to Roger City. It was after the Albert Molitor murder, so many of you may know of Baron Albert the alleged the legitimate king, uh, son of King Louis of Wittenberg, uh, a man who uh, was pretty much the dictator of Presque Isle County in Rogers City. After the assassination, people thought, oh, wait a minute, there were rumors spread that Leon was involved, he turned state, or Paul was involved, he turned state's evidence. All that happened, Molitor was murdered in 1875. So they moved him. He never even heard of really of Molitor after that. They moved out, he tried to get a job there, there really wasn't anything, just other some rural labor, so he comes back to Alpena, where they rented a home, no more buying. He worked on the docks here for the Fletcher Company, made about 25 and 30 cents per hour, which is fairly good at that time. He also worked at the lumber yard at the lumber mill, again, uh, Paul never fled from work. Paul and Mary had 10 children, nine of whom survived to adulthood. They had them approximately two years apart, and uh, during the, after he, she gave birth to Mary, or, or Mary gave birth to Victoria, she passed away about six weeks later. Uh, he, Paul tried to move her to Alpena to help her recover, to be closer to the doctors, and this was really a blow to Leon. Uh, he always was close with his family, but he really never seemed to recover fully from the passing. So, again, this is during this time period, they moved back to Alpena. Um, they stay there and work there. And about 18 months after Mary dies, uh, he marries Kat Katrin Katerina Metzhalter. To say that Leon and Katerina didn't get along is to understate it. They lived with each other, they hated each other. There was a point where they wouldn't be in the same room. When Katerina walked into the room, Leon would walk out. Interestingly enough, uh, Katerina and Paul had two children, and Leon liked the children. He liked his half-brothers. There was no problem there. His mother-in-law, 
is never going to replace his mother. Again, there was the house fire of 1885, which destroyed their family records. It was confirmed later. You know, there's a lot of interest in the Chagosh assassination. And uh, it was confirmed, yes, they weren't trying to hide anything. They just don't have records. He went to Catholic school. Leon did. He was a very bright student, um, very devoted, very religious early on. Um, Paul always said that Leon was the smartest one in the family. He was a voracious reader. He was still in school at age 16, which was unusual at the time. That Paul wanted him in school because Leon was the bright one. He could benefit from schooling. So that was usually you'd have your kids. That's why you had 10 kids, because that would help you with the income, help you with the farm. But Paul, no, Paul was staying in school. Leon. hear about afterwards how, oh, yes, you know, the, your, the guy who commits the horrible crime, he was a quiet man. He stuck to himself. He was very introverted. Well, that was Leon. He had almost no close friends. That really stands out in the record. The closest person in his life was probably his older brother, Waldeck. He was about the only one he ever really confided in. He would vanish from the home without notice. He would walk in the woods. He would go out reading. Um, really got along and well. He was willing to help out with the family, help out with chores, but if he had to be around his stepmother, that was probably a large part of the reason why he wandered around. Roughly 1890, they moved to Natrona, Pennsylvania first. They stayed there about 18 months. They did some factory work. Leon got his first job at about age 17. Well, actually a little shy of that. Um, working in the bottle plant there. And then they decided to move to Cleveland, and that's where they settled down in He worked, his first job was working in a glass bottle factory. This, earned a dollar per day moving the hot bottles after they've been blown. You know, um, take it, set them to cool. This was pretty grisly work. You were guaranteed to get burns. You were paid for speed. And it was a job, as you can see from the picture, where they favored the young. Because you could move quicker, you could dive around the factory, avoid the clutter, move quickly, cut big shortcuts. And it was hard work. It really, you know, if you dropped it, Forget your pay. In 1891, they finally got to Cleveland. Uh, one thing that the family did really well was they saved their money. And they saved it. They pooled their money together as a group. And all of them did. Thrift was a really part of, a big part of the Polish experience, but the, the Chalagash family really seemed to put it into high gear. They saved, they put all their money into common, and they worked together. And so Paul ended up buying building, rather, a store in a tavern. It was quite successful in 1892. Leon was a hard worker, too. He worked in the Newburgh Wire Factory in Cleveland. He was a wire winder. And then he worked in the heavy machinery operator, making $10 per week. Not too bad of money for the time. And I put this ad in here. <laughs> Speaking as an equal employment opportunity attorney, you cannot put this kind of ad in the paper anymore. It says, they're looking for tinners, catchers, and helpers to work at open shops. Syrians, Poles, and Romanians are preferred. <laughs> Please don't indicate you want national origin specific kind of help here. Um, unless you're maybe running an Irish tavern or something. I don't even do that. But it just shows the high, the Poles were known to work. And there was a stereotype of the working Pole. And that's what they looked for. And they did. Uh, even, even for a hard-working industrial man. Leon was known for his work ethic. He was never sick. He showed up, constantly worked. And one winter, he decided after working 12 hours in the factory, he was going to go to night school. He saved money very well. He donated to save money and finally actually bought a 50-acre farm outside of Cleveland. Still, he remained quite introverted, very quiet. He had one friend that I've been able to find in the literature, a man named Jugnach Lapka. But he walked back and forth to work. But really, that's about the only reference I've seen. And Luke Jugnaz kind of falls out of the narrative after that. Uh, he was not fond of rough housing or rough uh, behavior. He once saw his brother in a fight with others and, eh, sorry, Jake, you're going to get beat up. He says, if you will associate with those Polacks, his words, not mine, he will have to take the consequences. His favorite thing to do was to read, constantly. He read everything. 
he read uh, Ralph Bellamy's Looking Back, Backwards. It was kind of a utopian book talking about the ideal society written from the perspective of the 20th century. But anything, voracious reader of newspapers, anything that came in, the aunt would read. No, the book is called uh, Looking Backwards. It's a written, it's a utopian work. Bellamy talked about the ideal society, looking back how they built it. So it's kind of you know, like a positive version of 1984. So. Utopia, not dystopia. There we go. Leon would not, literally not hurt a fly. That's a quote from Mrs. Dwyer, a woman who helped out at the tavern. She saw him. One day a fly landed on him. And Leon quickly grabbed the fly by the wing, walked to the door, and let it out. Never harmed anything. He loved playing with children uh, of the family. He was never, never afraid of doing that. So, yeah, you're kind of wondering how we got to the point of shooting the president. And that's, we'll talk about insanity defenses and that sort of thing later. The Newburgh strike of 1893 was probably the breaking point of his life. Strikes at this time were illegal. Really, the only time they worked is if you had any kind of level of sympathy for you. And most of the time, what you'd see was the Pinkerton Detective Agency, strike breakers coming in, swinging truncheons, or they call up the troops. This is from a, uh, this picture is not from the Newburgh strike, it's from a textile worker strike in Massachusetts in 1910. But we called out the guard to deal with strikes back then. And you wonder why there was violent agitation. But they went on strike for wages, and all of them were fired. Leon, his brother Waldeck, who was the closest person in his life, said that Leon was really quiet, really unhappy. He went through not only a crisis of his belief in work and the value of work and how the society worked, but he went through a religious crisis. And it's really at this time that he starts to break away from the Catholic Church. He would never become a full bore atheist, but he would eventually distance himself from religion entirely. This is probably where he starts getting his taste for anarchism and pro-labor sentiments. He did return to work under the name of Fred C. Neiman, which is German for no man, or no one. It was the alias who was hiring him. And frankly, the foreman who hired him probably knew, him. you weren't supposed to rehire a striker, but you would rehire Leon Chagash because he was a worker, regardless of whether he struck. And Waldeck got hired, rehired too. You rehired good workers regardless of what the bosses said, but you probably shouldn't strike again. Again, the religious crisis. Um, Leon would spend a lot of time in prayer. He would, he would talk to priests, he would try to work through his, his struggles, he didn't see, he didn't understand the injustice of the world. And really about, like, by about 1896, he'd be violently, I mean not physically violent, but violent rhetoric about priests, about religion in general. And he would break with it. Not a full bore atheist, he didn't like to call himself that, but an American anti clerical, which is any kind of organized religion, you know, to quote from Marx, the opiate of the masses, I want nothing to do with. He would kind of waver near the end, express some interest in talking to a priest before his execution, but he really stayed away ultimately. After the strike, he joined a Polish study circle led by a man named Anton Zolinski. And it really, this is where he's, okay, now I understand. He starts studying social issues. Anarchism and socialism were the two competing things affecting American workers at this point. At least American workers who wanted to be activists. And Leon would eventually join the anarchist camp. Uh, he started with socialism, but he, didn't, he thought it didn't go far enough. And I'll explain to you the differences as we come a little bit later. He would drift, drift in and out of working men's groups, um, some groups would deny that he was ever a member, especially after the assassination. <laughs> we had nothing to do with him, no. Um, maybe, maybe not so credibly. But, and again, he was very interested in social issues. Bellamy's book was considered kind of a manifesto of how to build an ideal society. He, he and Baldick both read it. And this uh, poster here is right before the Haymarket riot, for the Haymarket Affair. And it's, it talks about revenge for the McCormick Reaper strike, and the strike breaking there. And we'll get to that because that's a huge moment too. What is anarchism? 
in some ways, it's kind of like trying to cut fog with a knife. Uh, there's a lot of different flavors, and I think if you have, there's an old joke, if you have three Jewish people in the room, you'll have five opinions. Um, if you have seven anarchists in the room, you're going to have 25 different flavors of anarchists. Um, sometimes it almost reads like, oh, small government, Jeffersonian, every man has, you know, no, kind of return to a state of nature, the sort of Rousseau, if we get rid of all of these clusters of societal norms that are artificial, everything will be fine. But really what it boils down to is all forms of government are based on forced violence and therefore are wrong and harmful. Why are they wrong and harmful? Because they enforce property laws which create inequality. And uh, it basically you should get what to each according to your needs and from each according to his ability. That's a Marx, Marxian term, obviously, but anarchists used it too with some overlap. So the idea is if you have property laws, you're automatically an oppressor. If you have allow property to accumulate and to be taken away from those who are labor, it's illegitimate. And states enforce property laws, therefore there should not be a state. And who do you strike out at? You strike out at those who are at the top of the state. You take action against them, either through strikes or direct action, bombing, assassination, which is what it really rolled into, unfortunately. <laughs> Johann Most is probably my favorite anarchist. Now, many of you may have heard of the Anarchist Cookbook. It was quite popular in the 70s, 80s. Uh, it, very, very controversial and have methods of assassination and so forth. I think Johann actually had to beat by about 75 years. For those of you who cannot read the title of his book, he wrote a book. He was a German immigrant and author of The Science of Revolutionary Warfare, a little handbook of instruction in the use and preparation of nitroglycerin, dynamite, gun cotton, fulminating mercury, bombs, fuses, poisons, Etc., etc. That's the title. So, yeah, he, uh, strangely enough, he was considered to be something of a troubling figure um, by the authorities for that publication. In fact, it was so bad that the New York Court of Appeals held in a ruling against a suit brought against the most by the authorities that it was a misdemeanor breach of the peace if you said that you were an anarchist in public. Maybe with Johann's book, it would make some sense. Um, in the Only in America files, I have to say this. Johann most eventually calmed down quite a bit. He changed his name to John. He settled in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and lived a pretty staid, kind of working middle class life. He had a grandson whose name should be familiar if you're a basketball fan. His grandson was Johnny Most the longtime radio and television broadcaster, color man for the Boston Celtics. The man, if you remember the 18, 1987 run where the Pistons lost in seven games, was made all sorts of excuses for how brutal Bill Lambeer was for assaulting Robert Parrish's fist with his face. Um, but yeah, Johnny Most was the son of an anarchist who published a cookbook trying to destroy people. Um, so I've always thought, hey, given what a homer Johnny was, he was kind of like his grandfather in that way. You know, he was kind of a polemicist himself. The big trigger for anarchism in the United States was the Haymarket Affair, or the Haymarket Riot. The McCormick Reaper plant, there was a strike. Two workers were killed at the manufacturing plant on May 30, 1986. The Pinkertons were called out, again, the detective agency. It was the strike breaker of choice for American industrial. A labor protest was called for May 4th. They were going to protest the deaths of the uh, workers and also advocate on behalf of an eight-hour workday. Henry Harrison was the mayor of Chicago, and he was in favor of the eight-hour workday. He was sympathetic to the workers. He thought the Pinkertons had gone just berserk and too far. He arrived at the, actually at the protest. He left later, but he told the police, I expect restraint. It would turn out otherwise. As the demonstration came to a close about 10.30, 200 police officers marched into Haymarket Square and told them to disperse. A bomb, it's not entirely clear by whom, 
was thrown from the crowd, detonated, and killed seven police officers and wounded another 60. The police opened fire. At least 50 workers were killed and wounded. Probably more. The figures were never kept. The figures were, it was impossible to tell. It was basically an explosion of gunfire. In response, seven men were arrested, five German American immigrants and two English immigrants from England were all anarchists. A raid was done and at, a, at the place of a man named Louis Ling, Louis Ling's, excuse me, who found bomb parts that seemed to line up accordingly. There was a man named Rudolf Schnaubelt who probably threw the bomb, who was an anarchist. The police kept arresting and letting go because they couldn't tell what he was and eventually Schnaub up fled the country. Probably think he was twice lucky. It was a quick trial and a quick execution. The Chicago Tribune published this uh, editorial saying, let us whip these Slavic wolves back to the European dens from which they issue or in some way exterminate them. That was how you dealt with anarchism. And if you were a Pole living in Chicago at the time, you'd think, what did we have to do with this? It was five Germans and two Englishmen. But it was a frenzy. And actually, uh, one of the historians later said, the, the reason these men were executed is because of the Chicago Tribune. It was an endless stream of crush them, crush them. And it happened. Four of them were executed right away. One was given a sentence of 15 years. And two of them, they put off the executions. There were delays and appeals. The reaction to it was polarized. The mob button was an interesting thing. You could install it inside your uh, house, if you're a rich industrialist or businessman, a button that would go right to the police department if there's a mob coming. Just push the button. It's kind of like an early panic room. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, I'd be happy to bring my cowboys in from out west. We'll go and rope and shoot ourselves some anarchists. Which would be somewhat ironic later, given the fact that Roosevelt actually became quite sympathetic to laborers. But over time, what happened was, Everybody seemed to realize, okay, this was overboard. And the last two men were pardoned, and you know, it was worldwide furor. There was a lot of complaints about this was a, uh, a lynch mob trial. It was a kangaroo court. It was just really, the defense, the defense team for the anarchists was less than, put it gently. But it was happening at a time, really what you're going to see here, in the seven years before McKinley's death, Four heads of state would be, would be killed by anarchists and terrorist attacks. Sadi Carnot would be from left to right. The president of France was killed by an anarchist. The Empress Elizabeth of Austria was stabbed to death by one on a pier. Uh, El Antonio Canovas, the prime minister of Spain, also killed in a shooting. And finally, the big one was King Umberto of Italy, who had been targeted several times by anarchists, was finally shot by a name named uh, Gaetano Bresci would be a real influence on um, Leon in many ways. And the, the, the assassination of King Alberto was in 1900. And in, in this time, you've got a wave of bombings, attacks. It's not just on heads of state, but industrialists. You have you know, Frank, um, Henry Frank was attacked and barely survived. Uh, you have like the parliament of, uh, was a bomb thrown in the parliament of France. A bomb was detonated at the Winter Palace of the Russian, Russian Tsar. It's literally happening all the time. Now, the one distinction I would say between the anarchists generally did not do indiscriminate terror bombings. They went for targets, the targets associated with society. There were some exceptions. There was the man who threw a bomb in France said, well, you, you could have killed any number of innocent people. Said, oh, no, there are no innocent bourgeois. If they die, they die. Some, I, I don't want to overlook uh, the fascinating figure of William McKinley. He tends to be forgotten. He, 25th President of the United States, was kind of looked at as kind of a gray sort of pro-business figure. He really was fascinating. He was the only president of the United States to run, who served in the Civil War who rose from the ranks. He fought at some of the bloodiest battles of the war. He fought in Antietam, uh, South Mountain, and at Cedar Creek. Basically, he became a major, rising up from just a buck private. After the war, he met the love of his life, a woman named Ida Saxton. He married her in 18, January of 1871, and 
Tragically, while their marriage was happy, it would be haunted by tragedy. It would be haunted by events. They lost both their daughters. Um, one at four months of age, and then the other at four years of age from typhoid. Ida herself developed a seizure disorder in uh, 1976 and was an invalid, basically. McKinley would excuse himself from White House briefings. I have to take care of my wife. You can handle this. He would wave to her across the hall or across the street. He would come out every 2 o'clock every afternoon, wave a handkerchief so I didn't see it. It really it was a beautiful marriage. He was a wildly popular figure. He was elected for uh, seven terms of Congress. He lost a seat to a gerrymander, ran for governor the next year and won. He went bankrupt in the Panic of 1893, and that really endeared him to a lot of people. He just came out and said, I have nothing left. And for workers, well, it was a really bad time for that. <laughs> How about never? Um, snooze? Okay, I'm trying to figure what... I don't know. Maybe this thing. <laughs> I would hope not. Uh, I can't stand it. Oh, I'm sorry. I have stepped on the Windows 10 people. For those of you who love it, wonderful. I think they screwed up after seven. Yeah, eight, eight's all right. Okay. His first case was defending striking workers, which was not a great way to start off as a shave tail lawyer. Uh, he mediated labor disputes. And as governor, he's very considered very pro, uh, pro worker. He actually won the majority of the working vote in 1896 and 1900. He supported the coining of silver, which meant there'd be more money flowing around to the working man. And he defended tariffs. He was believed in the Napoleon of tariffs, he was called, because if you're not going to trade with us fairly, well, we're going to slap tariffs on everything you send over here. He was willing, if you traded fairly with us, he was willing to cut you a break. But other than that, no. Free trade was really not on the horizon here. It's the Republican Party, which is kind of a switch for today. Um, very eventful presidency. Just to, I'll just do a few. Spanish-American War in 1898. Annexation of Hawaii in the same year. Philippine insurrection. Um, he was the first Republican to win a state in the South. He won that in 1901 in Kentucky, rather in 1900. Um, he was considered to be very very favorable to civil rights, and that was one thing he was kind of fell down on the ground. He was actually very strongly anti-lynching against, you know, the repression of African Americans in the South. He was a little weaker as a president for that. He still spoke out on it, but it was more measured and ambiguous. He, not that he was in favor of it, but he just was trying to conciliate the South. Chao Leon, from about 1898, through the assassination, he basically became more and more involved in worker struggles. Um, he was a member, the one thing he stayed a member of was the Order of the Knights of the Golden Eagle, which is kind of a, uh, almost Knights of Columbus for workers. Uh, basically mutual relief, you help out. It was very unusual for an immigrant or a Catholic to be elected in that fraternity, but he was. Um, and he was stayed a member until 1901. He quit his job on August 28, 1998 which was a shock to everyone. Um, he told his family he was going to, he told his foreman, I got to, my help is bad. He would be very cranky when his family asked him, what's your problem? He was coughing a lot. Um, the term was used was great chunks every time he coughed. He ordered an inhaler to use it. He was taking potassium iodide, which was a treatment for syphilis, a totally ineffective treatment for syphilis, but it was used to treat it. Um, he spoke, but the only time he ever talked about a woman was he said, well, it was possible betrayal in a relationship. And there was a belief at the time that syphilis could be spread by handling of blown glass. So the thought was that he, the autopsy showed no syphilis, but the thought was that he maybe he thought he had it. And unfortunately, taking potassium iodine gives you more symptoms of syphilis. Not only does it not work to treat it, but it'll actually give you the symptoms if you don't have it. He stayed around the homestead 
reading anarchist newspapers, getting dispatched with his mother-in-law that seemed to have been, the, he seemed to enjoy pressing her buttons. Um, she couldn't stand him, especially when he quit his job. He was useless, he was lazy. Uh, he, he loved his half-brothers, but you know, he's listless, he's useless, he's not doing anything else. So uh, he would go out and hunt and shoot. That's where he gets his familiarity with firearms. And he stayed a lot more with the family when she moved to Cleveland to take care of her own family. Right here. Emma Goldman. Um, she was the queen of the anarchists. An indefatigable lecturer. She went around the country, literally gave up to 210 lectures per year. You think about that. Two-thirds of the year, you travel, lecture, travel, lecture. She was a Russian-Jewish immigrant. She was not an observant Jew. She was Russian Jewish. Uh, you know, the pogroms drove her family out. They came over here from Lithuania. Uh, her lover, Andrew Alexander Berkman, attempted to assassinate Carnegie Steel executive Henry Frank in uh, retaliation for Carnegie's using Pinkertons to kill their workers. Uh, he failed, fortunately. After this, she herself was uh, imprisoned for a year for inciting to riot. Her speeches were read. And I will say that she was the queen of mixed signals because she would always say, oh, violence is wrong. Violence is wrong. If you've ever written it, that, she said that in the exact same tone as the offer is void in Wisconsin. She would always say, oh, 